the Roman Crusade. Hey, we're looking at our glittery purple binder here, and that means it's time to take a look at the activities of the Roman Empire. In our last episode, we dealt with this little prisoner rescue that happened on July 11th. We have another battle to fight that also happens on July 11th. We'll zoom in down here real quick. We got a lot going on over here in the West. On the 11th, Latora Khan and a massive army are busy crossing the Sunderland River right about here. They're about two, three days away from Watchtower Hill. Also on the 11th, we had our little prisoner rescue. You will remember this from last week. We did seven of them, and it turns out the one that the fate has decreed is that the Broman Light Horse lost about half their number. They did rescue 525 of their heavy foot. They dispatched 15 Light Horse with them to kind of guide them. It'll take the long way around Kajdraj Ven, and they are, I think, basically out of the campaign. Now, we do have to do the battle here at the gates of Watchtower Hill. This is the whole point of the exercise. The Bromans are trying to break into this tomb and secure the girdle of Vince McMaximus. They get here on the 11th, and later in the day, the cleavers show up. So that opens the door for the possibility that the Romans have to win fast because night will fall, and then the orcs will have some kind of an advantage. Now, we're going to look at the numbers here. We're going to look at the terrain in a little more detail. All we know right now are the direction that the armies are entering the battlefield and a little bit about the terrain. This is, we'll probably use our Skull Hill. We've got a river that kind of cuts the battlefield in half. And we know that the Bromans were there first. There is room for a little more details. There may be a couple of little stands of trees or, or a swamp or a hill or two elsewhere that could have a, a tactical effect on the battle. We'll look at that in a second. But before we do, I also need to set up another battle. If we scroll on over here to the east and then head south to right about here, what we find is that the Nashers have, on the 11th now, they arrive in the, on the outskirts of Blagden. The three huts that you see here mean this is a mid-sized town with a wall that they'll have to lay siege to. However, they've got the emperor's own army marching from Broholm to stop them to break the siege. Rather than set up for the siege there, the Nashers are going to take a hard right turn, follow the road, and we'll call this the Battle of Blagton Road. Just a, just a day's march. Now, the rate of advance along a road is three quarters of an inch. This is a little bit less than halfway between the town and where the emperor was on the 11th. So we're looking at a battle here, and I'll just write that down, on the 12th. Which is not enough time. By the time we're done with this battle here on the 11th, the Torah Khan and his big army will be eh, right about here. And depending on what happens here, either the Romans will be breaking into the tomb or they'll be you know, headed in, in full retreat. Now, the difficulty they have is they're going to have to retreat through the Elvish lands. It's possible this army may be doomed. They do have about 75 light horse racing to meet them so we'll have to factor that into the post-battle sequence they may be able to screen this army or they may be able to help chase down the remnants of the cleavers so turning our attention back here to the west we'll have to figure out what the terrain is going to look like here and i want to do this today because something very interesting is going to happen the next two episodes will be the playing of the battle of watchtower hill and then we're going to do, well, somebody's going to do the Battle of Blagton Road. Are you familiar with a little group called the Armchair Dragoons? You probably should be. They're a great group of guys, and Jim Ozarski is affiliated with them. And on his channel, he's got the tabletop simulator. And man, like four or five times a week, if not every night, he sets up a full-blown miniature battle that he invites like six of his friends in, and they just... Film the whole darn thing, all three to four hours. I stop in from time to time, you know, if I'm on my commute. I just want to hang out with some guys that are playing miniature war games. Highly recommend it. Jim is very knowledgeable. He's the war gamer I want to be when I grow up. He's got a top ten list of his ten favorite Napoleonic rule sets. I don't even know if I could name ten rule sets. 
I I got my top like three that I own and have tried. It, not counting, you know, convention games and one offs. So I'm just I'm always astonished at how he's able to keep so many rule sets in his head and do such a bang up job presenting them. At any rate, the reason I'm telling you about that guy and the reason I'm kind of building him up is because of A, I'm a really big fan, but B, I jumped into one of the streams that they were hosting. It was a battle of Lachiang, uh, some, I don't know, some European word. Uh, it was a Napoleonic battle, and I just said, hey guys, what's up? And Jim said, hey, I have been interested in what you've been doing with this campaign, and we're going to do, we're going to refight one of your battles. I said, whoa, bro, what are you refighting one of my battles for? Why don't I generate a battle, turn the reins over to you, you run the battle, and then I'll watch the stream, and I'll figure out from the stream, or you can report back to me what happens in the battle, and we'll make that canon in the campaign. So we got to talking a little bit offline, and he's going to be using Chipko's fantasy rules to play out a humans versus orcs battle. And I am going to ask him to do the Battle of Blagton Road. Now, we'll go over today. I'll just let you know what those forces are, and we'll start here. But that's all I'm going to do. I just gonna, I'm going to take a picture of this, and I'm going to send him the orders of battle, and I'm going to say they're both coming at each other. They know there's going to be a fight. Nothing too surprising. The only piece of terrain I can tell them about is this improved road that runs basically east to west and that the armies are coming in on. Go to town, brother. We're not solo wargaming anymore. We're gaming alone as a group. We're inviting people in to share the joy of wargaming. So that's it. Let's start over here and take a look at this Battle of Blagton Road, shall we? As I said, we are going to have two armies. It'll be the... Well, let's, let's get that's obnoxious. Okay. We are going to have the Emperor's Own Army. And this is pretty easy. Now, they are fresh as a daisy. They have been walking on the road for one, two, three, about four days. So they're still good. And it's not a particularly big one. We've got 600 heavy foot, almost 1,500 armored foot. Now, remember, it goes light, heavy, armored. So these are the heavy hitters. These are the big boys, the power boys. And we've got 400 heavy horse on the side of the humans. On the other side, we've got a fairly blown out remnants of the Nashers. And the Nashers, remember, they picked up the remains of the army that got trounced at the Battle of... Baron Elizabeth Farm, the first battle of the Baron Elizabeth Farm. So what you see here in the Nashers, what you see... Where's the Nashers? Oh, there they are. The Nashers, this is who they will have effective on the 8th. Now, they do have some wounded that will come back to them, but not for another week. Remember, our battle takes place on the 12th in another eight days they'll add these numbers but for now it's going to be a much more variegated force we've got 175 light foot for the orcs 1250 heavy foot now they lost 50 guards who are we'll get to that in a second and then you've got 200 light horse 200 medium horse and 100 heavy horse you've seen my light horse are actually wolves that's how i model them but there's no requirement these are the numbers i'm giving to jim to run with so if we add all this up, we're looking at 1750, 18, 1925 altogether for the orcs. 1925 versus for the humans, it's going to be about 2500. A fairly substantial advantage to the humans. I wonder if the orcs don't want to wait on this one. What would they wait for, you ask? Well, I'm glad you asked. Now that the prisoners down here have been rescued, if the orcs want to bring Murray Mack, the giant, into the game, they're going to have to march the prisoners from 2nd Baron Elizabeth Farm up to the north. And I've already run the numbers. If you look at this, the Nashers had the prisoners here on the 11th. Remember, we're talking about the 12th right now. So on the 12th, they're only going to be here. 13, 14, and then they cross on the 15th, 16, 17. They got to rest on the 18th, 19th, 20th. They're going to arrive on the 21st, set out on the 22nd. Man, that's a long way to go. So we got to look a little bit ahead. And this assumes weather is good. I've only figured out that the weather is clear 
through July 15th. That means if these guys really want to go to war against the Emperor's Own, which they might, they're going to have to take the fact that they are pretty badly outnumbered. Alternatively, because they've cut the road to Blagton, they may be able to halt, set up first, and kind of make up for their lack of numbers by assuming a much more defensive stance. The Emperor's Own is going to have to break through this army to relieve Blagton. All right, so that's what's going on in the east. Now, let's turn our attention back to the west and figure out what we need for next week's battle of Watchtower Hill. One more footnote on the Battle of Blagton Road. Jim is very generous to offer this. There are no guarantees in this life. If, for whatever reason, they're not able to pull it off, if they, they're just, for whatever reason, it doesn't happen in the next several weeks, it's fine. It's not a big deal. We can always run it ourselves. But every time I have the opportunity to bring more people in to the fun that we're having here, I'll take it. So this is our rough sketch match map. This is the Battle of Blag uh, Watchtower Hill. I'll, as usual, I will, once we do the messy version, I'll sit down, drop a nice clean one, and we'll go from there. The only thing we know right now is that we've got Skull Mountain right here that has the ruins of a fortress on top. And out from the mouth pours a waterfall into a pool of water. And then we've got a stream that flows somewhere down here. To figure that out, I'm just going to roll a d6. And to see exactly where this river runs off the southern edge of the map, we're just going to draw 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. There it is right there. So we have a river that flows something like this. This is the God Spring River. And we may put a little bend or two once we sit down to draw the map. We Oh! This is on a hill, so we'll kind of draw a hill there that that goes on. Because we have, well, this is not enough terrain, obviously. I guess it's enough terrain, but, you know, a bowling green with a single river and a hill, you know, and, and the top of this hill will be uncrossable. The pool will also be uncrossable, so we have a little bit of a, an area up here. And I guess the other question is, at this point, with the water streaming out, how bad is the river? So to figure that out. On a one, it's a, it's barely a trickle through here. It, it picks up steam as it flows to the south. On a six, it is, well, we can't make it completely uncrossable. So what we'll do is we'll say on a one or a two, on a one, it's nothing. And on a six, it takes a full turn. In other words, you move here, and then it takes a full turn to cross. Okay? You stop there, full turn. Uh, and then, you know, in between, so like two, three, it'll cost one inch. Three, four, it'll cost two inches, and on a five, it'll cost three. So there you go. It's a fairly substantial river that comes running across, running down, and it's three inches to cross. Not a full turn, but if you only have three inches of movement, you are going to have to stop here. Spend the next turn spending your three inches to get across, right? There you go. So that's the God Spring River, fairly raging torrent through here. And then we need to figure out the rest of the terrain. Now, we have a pretty good amount of terrain. So normally what we do is we deal our cards out in a 4x4 four four pattern. But as you can see, I've already got terrain through like this area. So I'm going to deal out a card here, here, and then we'll do 2, 2, and 2. Well, I guess that's not fair. I guess we'll say that the... this. Oh, no. What am I talking about? What we'll do is we'll deal out all, all 16 cards as we usually do. But this time we'll only count the spades as terrain features. Normally it's spades and clubs. Today it's just the spades. And we'll cut the deck. I've already shuffled these, but we'll cut it just to keep, me, keep us honest. And we're only looking for spades. And there's a couple there. So rather than averaging one terrain feature every other card, that's a lot of black cards. This time around, we're going to have one terrain feature in every four cards. And... Oh, that's uh, we, we. This is a fairly confusing jumble, isn't it, guys? We wound up with six out of our sixteen, which is you know, two more than average. I guess it's not too bad. Then we have to go to our book and figure out. Now, there's a lot down here in the corner, isn't there? It's not as bad as I thought. Since we're doing just general terrain, I'm using the the results 
as written. Kings and queens are both grass. Well, we're already in the grasslands, so we're going to remove these two. And we're going to be left with four pieces of terrain. The four and the five are going to be heavy woods. So we'll mark that up there and down there. And then the ace and the ten, the ace will be a hill and the ten will be a marsh. So our overall terrain for this battle is going to look a little something like this. We've got a hill. We've got a marsh. And I guess we could even put that marsh right through the stream, which means the marsh costs half movement, but that will be an opportunity to uh, perhaps move across the stream, perhaps a uh, place that you can afford it a little bit quicker. Oddly enough, the marsh might be your friend, and otherwise we're good to go. So the next thing we have to look at is, does our Broman force come in through this narrow gap here, or do they come in through here? And actually, I don't think it matters, because remember that the Bromans were here first. So I think what we'll do is we'll let the Bromans deploy anywhere on this side of the map. And then the question is, do the orcs have to come in south of the hill or north of the hill? There's a little more space up here. So let's call it on a one or a two, and on a four, three or better, they come in up here. There you go. So the, the orcs are going to be coming in right out of the corner. The good news for the orcs is that the Bromans have to set up first. Now, the Bromans have a total of 1,740 heavy foot. In other words, they're going to have two blocks of troops, one with eight stands, eight and a half, let's call it, and one with nine. And then they have 400, or a single four stands, excuse me, of heavy horse. That being the case, why don't we... Anchor our line on the pool. And we'll just try, well, because we want the orcs, are, are the orcs coming to us? Let's take a look at the cleavers real quick. The cleavers are going to be coming at us with 1,600, well, 15 stands let's call it it's 1575 and then they've got a total of three and a half stands of light horse who are largely going to just hang out so we'll kind of stick the four light horse up here for them i'm sorry i, I said we do these guys first didn't i the it's also worth pointing out we've got a total of three figures or a single stand that already has one wound of light horse that are coming from this direction. That will be important for figuring out retreats. The orcs do not want to retreat off in this direction because they're going to get hammered by those light horse who are showing up pretty quick. So I think that's probably pretty good. I think we go ahead and stick our Bromans here. Now remember that the Bromans are just looking to defend this line. They're going to send a party of adventurers down into the tomb. So if we put our eight, and we'll call it a half, and I'll draw the little plus, so there's just two more figures there, is what it amounts to. And then we we don't want our heavy horse. Our heavy horse we're going to leave in reserve. We're just going to put them, now they're fairly slow, so we actually may wind up putting them like right here. So they can move in either direction. And then we'll put the other stand right here. The other nine. So that's eight. And then I guess I gotta erase one. So we got nine stands of heavy foot, heavy foot. And then here's our and we'll put them back here. Here's our heavy horse. Alright, now the Bromans have deployed. I'll erase those guys. On the northern side of the battlefield. The orcs have to drive them from the field. Unfortunately for the orcs, they are on the attack, and oh my goodness, they are outnumbered, aren't they? The good news for the orcs is that they've got reinforcements coming in just a couple of days. So when they come onto the battlefield, they are going to set up, and I think, it's, again, since we have our... Come here, Nashers. I don't want to have to try to remember any of this. Not Nashers, it's the Cleavers, isn't it? There we go. We've got 
fifth, we got a total of 16. So in this case, it's going to be 8. 1, 2, 3, and 8. Coming in something like that. 8 and 8 with our light horse. Is that really it? Yep. The good news for the orcs from a strategic point of view is that any damage they do, you know, maybe, maybe we have a strategic question here. Do the orcs need to attack? After all, they've got the Bromans caught in a pincher mo movement here, don't they? With Lotora Khan riding hard on them. Now that we've laid this out, it might make more sense for the Bromans to force the Cleavers from the field. That being the case, I'm thinking the Bromans, are they still going to want to set up there? Well, we said they have to start there. So, yeah, I guess this is it. This is the battle we're going to fight. The Bromans probably aren't going to want to stay there, though. They're going to have to come out and meet these guys because they cannot afford to be laid siege. Oh, that's the other question is they've only got so many supplies. They have to have a decisive battle here. So as the orcs come up, what we'll do is we'll put the orcs on this hill right here. And we'll put the light horse on the hill behind them. So there's your light horse. There's our heavy foot. There's our heavy foot. And then we've got heavy foot and heavy foot. And it's really going to be incumbent on the Bromans to drive these guys from the field, which puts them at a bit of a disadvantage, but at least they've got the heavy horse. Understanding that strategic point of view, we're going to put the heavy horse right on the battlefield as well, or right on the river as well. We said they had to deploy on this side of the river. They're going to deploy right on it because the Bromans are going to come straight at them. All right, now we know what our terrain looks like. We know what our forces are. We've got our orders of battle for both the Battle of Watchtower Hill and for the Battle of Blagdon Road. We'll see you next week for the thrilling, I mean, this, not necessarily the conclusion. I just, just to show you what we're looking at. If the Bromans win this fight here at Watchtower Hill, They'll spend the 12th recovering their wounded, sending guys in to get this girdle. Then Latora Khan is going to have a decision to make. Note that across the plains, and I can even show you how this works, the army of Latora Khan, I'll show it to you to uh, satisfy any of you who doubt me. Where's that army, Latora? There we go. Army of the Khan. He's got two, he's got 3,000 men. There's no way the Bromans can stand up to this. All right. He even has the survivors that escaped from Sir Dude. What that means is because he's got all of those armored foot and they're moving cross country, we check our movement rates. Moving cross country. Uh, Swamps River's off road. Infantry only move a half an inch. So if we figure this out, they cross on the 11th. On the 12th, they arrive here. And if we even make a beeline, it's going to be 13th, 14th, 15th. Now, it's going to be the 16th before they even get here. Okay? So the Bromans do have time to get that girdle and get down to the south. Hmm. And maybe the Khan lets them go. On the other hand, what if... The army of the Khan says, you know what? I don't need all this foot. Why don't I just send all thousand heavy horse down to intercept these guys? Well, they are heavy horse. Does that mean anything? Not for us, because our movement rates here, off-road, cavalry move four hexes per turn. If Khan decides to send his forces ahead, and... Bear in mind, he could even do this on the 12th, right? 12, 13, oh. But on the 13th, our army is going to slip away across the river to here. So we may be able to do a little bit of a fight down somewhere in here. We'll do the actual numbers later. But we may have that 1,000 heavy horse. 
that's ten stands of heavy horse to contend with, right? Um, one, two, so to keep it simple, we'll say they arrive across the 12th on the 13th, and they can even make it to here on the 14th, whereas our boys, 13, 14, are going to be here. So on the 14th, if the Bromans win, they'll be here. They'll be here, and the Khan will be just a half a day's ride behind them. So it looks like the Bromans will be able to get into the woods. Will that satisfy the Khan, though? Stay tuned. I'm praying for you.